Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, so um, my name is Lee Kravitz. Um, this is uh, Maya Lundy. I'm going to mispronounce a ton of stuff. Is it Lundy? Uh, Lunde. Lunde. Perfect. Lunde? Yes. Got it. First try. <laughs> um, so uh, we are here to talk a little bit about um, a, a series of remarkable books that get even more remarkable the more I'm learning about what she has in store for all of us. Um, I'm so glad everybody's here. Happy Sunday morning. Um, and I figured I'll start by just doing a brief intro, talk a little bit about her, uh, uh, Maya's work, and then um, I have a bunch of questions for her. But this is, you know, because we're sort of, you know, a smaller group today, feel free to, you know, there'll be time for Q&A, obviously. But if there's a question that comes up based on something that we're talking about, feel free to just jump in. We'll just make it real casual today. All right. Um, so uh, Maya Lundi, Lunda? Lunda. Yeah. Um, is the most, this is cool, this is the most successful Norwegian author of her generation. Her books are translated into 40 languages and have sold more than 2.5 million copies. Um, that is a lot of books. That is a lot of books. Um, she's written 12 children's and young adult books, and her 2018 children's book, The Snow Sister, is one of the biggest literary successes of Norway in decades. The history of bees, which is how I was first introduced to her work, um, in 2015 was her first novel for adults. It was a huge bestseller. Uh, the biggest book of 2017 in Germany as well. So I mean, this is, this is wonderful. Her second novel, Blue, uh, book two of uh, her planned climate quartet, which we'll talk about, uh, followed by book three. Um, it, it was called something different in Norway, right? So here we call it uh, the last of the wild horses, but it's the Przewalski horse. And that comes into play big time in, in this. So you can talk to us a little bit about, I have a lot of questions about these horses. Um, uh, yeah, so it's known in the US as The Last of the Wild Horses, which is a beautiful sort of prismatic um, book um, that uh, we'll talk about more today as well. Um, and you live in Oslo, correct? Okay, I'm gonna mispronounce this too. Godlia? Godlia. Yeah, Godlia. okay, Gulia. Gulia, Gulia. <laughs> so you can see that there's some, we were talking about translation. All of her books have been translated, and the books that I've read and we'll talk about today have been translated um, into English. And we were talking about how in Norway the language is very sort of plastic. It, it, it can be interpreted in many, many different ways. So I'm really curious about how we, you, the translation sort of changes the tone and tenor of each of these books. Um, but let's start with, um, I figured we'd actually frame a lot of today's talk um, about with her latest book. The Last of the Wild Horses, or uh, Przewalski's Horse in uh, Nor uh, Norwegian. Um, and when I say it's a prismatic book, what, what's amazing about it is it's three stories. It's basically three novels that are split and, and each ind independently written, split, merged together, and twisted together to form a cohesive story that, that spans generations. Um, the first one, 1881 in St. Petersburg, uh, the bones of a newly de uh, deceased wild horse is shipped all the way from Mongolia to the zool uh, zoologist Michael. Did I pronounce his cor name correct? It's Michael, right? Mikhail. Mika Mikhail. 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 But I'm not Russian, so okay. you can say Michael. I'm going to yeah. say Michael. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who discovers it's the same as the prehistoric wild horse thought to be long extinct. This sets Mikhail um, on an expedition to Mongolian plains with an adventurer named Wolf, who's... Uh, offers more than we expect. Um, let's see, yeah, and he, uh, you're right. So who helps him discover much more than horses? I'll just leave it at that. Uh, Mongolia, 1992, is a second story. We meet uh, veterinarian Karen, who works to bring the Przewalski, Przewalski, what did I mispronounce yeah, it's really hard. You can also say Taki, which is Taki. the Mongolian name for it. I, that was a lot easier to, to pronounce. The Taki uh, horses from Europe back to Mongolia, where the last wild horses died out decades ago, in an attempt to reintroduce them to the wild. And this results with varied and sometimes tragic um, events. And then we move all the way to 2064. 
Um, and this is fascinating. There's a, a woman named Eva who refuses to give up on her farm in, a Europe, in Europe that is falling apart. It's sort of a post-apocalyptic Europe or world. There's no power, there's diminishing food, and they're uh, raising the last of the wild mares when a strange woman appears in their lives named Luis. Uh, it's stunning, surprising, it's deeply moving. Um, each story, I mean, maybe we should just start here. You have three different stories, and they're sort of, like I said, they start and stop and lead into the next, into the next, into the next. Doing that is a really hard thing to pull off. How did you do it? I mean, this is how. Uh, actually, I write uh, each story um, separately. So I, uh, in the first draft, that is, I write all through the, the, each and every story. And then I start to put them together um, and weave them into each other. Uh, and usually, when I do that, a lot of things happen and they start to mirror each other in ways I haven't seen. So that's, I guess that's when you write fiction, you sometimes feel that the texts are alive and um, things happen that you don't have control uh, over. It's almost like, as you're, I can almost picture it, you're writing each one separately, then as you merge them together, there's some synchronicity that sort of happens. And I can imagine, even for, the, for you as the author, it is surprising. It's, it's, oh wow, I can see these sort of themes coming together. Yes, and suddenly you have an ending of one chapter, and then you see that the next, that you didn't even plan to put there, somehow it uh, there resembles each other and fit together in, okay. in patterns you haven't seen. So I did have a question about this. We're gonna, just going to go off script here a little bit, guys. So there are moments where one character, uh, for instance, um, starts to fall in love with another character. And then the, fu the next story, there's a romantic thread as well. Um, was, was that sort of planned when you put it together? Or was that sort of like synchronistic, sort of accidental, but it worked to really bring out more than you thought? Both, I think. Okay. Yes. But I knew from the very beginning that uh, there would be love stories in this book. Uh, I mean, all my novels are about relationships uh, between yeah. parents and children and also between uh, people, yeah, love man, men and men and women and it, men. And men and <laughs> men and women and women. It's, it, and it's, that's the surprising, the surprising piece. You start reading each of these stories and each of these novels and you sort of know that there's, there are going to be romances, there's going to be development of character, um, but each one is surprising. I never, saw, I never knew exactly where they were going to go or how they were going to resolve. Um, but let's talk about the love stories first, because there are themes with parents and children. That's a big theme, and specifically this book um, I, that I, 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 I just fell in love with. Um, but when, when you're writing the romances, when you're throwing these together, um, does it happen naturally? Is, is this sort of pre-planned? How, do how, how does it come about, again, process for you? How does that happen? Uh, quite often when I write, it feels like it happens. And it feels like the text is alive. But for me, writing is always about getting into the head of the main character mm -hmm. and actually being in the situation and living it. Yeah. Uh, not only emotionally, but also you know, physically. Uh, freezing when they to freeze when they are freezing to to be thirsty when they are sad when they are to feel it inside my body, and I guess empathy is sort of the most important tool I have when I write. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and and while writing things happen, but of course also I'm I'm a, as you will probably say or uh, later I'm a screenwriter as yep, well. That's great. Yeah. So I work quite visually, and also if I'm stuck, I'm good at making plans for my texts, and I'm good at sort of taking a step away and use all the tools I have from screenwriting, and looking looking at it from you know. A distance, and that also helps, and that also, of course, makes um, it. It I guess so. It's sort of through learning. I also have, you know, a method of seeing patterns and finding parallels. What well, is it's sort of um, d because you do screenwriting and you do novel writing. You've done young adults. You've done children's books. These are, I mean, yes, you're using similar tools. 
but you are, your tool chest is huge. I mean, writing for children, writing for screen, and writing adult fiction, I mean, this is, that is a huge amount of, uh, well, knowledge that you have to have to understand how to do that and to, to actually communicate what you want to do. I mean, writing, this, I, let me ask you this, writing screenplays versus, you know, uh, versus writing a novel. Um, you're talking about when you are writing a novel, you're basically, you have to invent the, the, all the environment. You have to invent the internal um, mechanisms and, and thoughts and feelings of a character and the outside world as well. Um, when you're doing screenwriting, I mean, do you still have that sort of process with that? Well, it's a huge difference between screenwriting and novels because when you write a novel, you write what the character uh, feels. You write through the eyes of the character. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to be inside the story. But when you write uh, for a uh, screen or TV, mm -hmm. you write what the audience see. So you need to write through the eyes of the audience instead. And you write what they see and they hear. So it's, and it's sort of a distance uh, when you write for screen and TV. And you have, to tell, you have to show everything. You can't tell. You can't say what the character is thinking. Uh, so it's yeah. a huge difference and also sometimes it can be really deliberating to write for screen because you don't really have to think about language. The language doesn't have to be good. <laughs> you just, <laughs> it's need just to put it need out there. to explain properly what's happening in, Which, in the scene. Well, I'm, I'm curious. Um, so talk to us a little bit about the screen, uh, screenwriting and the films and, and television that you've worked on. Well, I've done uh, one young adult film, which is on Netflix, actually, uh, called Battle. And I've done a um, children's film called Border Crossing, which is set from in the, it's in the Second World War. It's actually a family film. Yeah. And right now I'm working on a new uh, family film based on a Norwegian fairy tale. So it's quite, you know, it's... And I've also done, done some uh, TV series, uh, earlier and will probably work with TV as well, with TV drama. But uh, yeah, can't say much about that yet. <laughs> I think it's amazing. Would you mind telling us a little bit about, I mean, this is going way, way back, and I promise we'll get back to the books, but I'm really curious. Did you start out writing, I mean, you started writing children's books first and YA books first? Did you start doing television and film first? What was your process getting into this? I actually, I wrote a lot when I was uh, little and young. And then, but I was also really, you know, into movies. Yeah. So I took um, a master in film and media, and I started to work in the film industry. And then I actually started to just write uh, scripts because mm -hmm. uh, I read so many scripts in, in my job, and I realized I. I could do this. I could do this. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I worked as a screenwriter for a couple of years. And then I got really tired of the film industry because everything takes so long. Yeah. And I was kind of eager to get my projects done. So then I actually wrote a book. It's saying of, something. Fr from one of the scripts. It's saying something that it's quicker to get a book written and published than to get something produced. Oh, and, yes. Yeah. And, if, and that film, actually, uh, that, was my, that was The Border Crossing. And the film took 10 years. So it's, wow. yeah, uh, it's quite consuming. Um, but, uh, and then, you know, when I started to write fiction, it was sort of an epiphany. Because it was like finding, going back to something I had done when I was young and yeah. really loved. And it's strange because when I look back at the things I wrote as a, a teenager, the voice is really the same. You're kidding. And the themes, the themes are the same as well. I wrote about nature, I wrote about um, quite dystopian uh, themes, I wrote about parents and children and relationships, so it's really just, I, it's, it's fascinating. <laughs> it's wonderful, and it means that you've always known what you wanted to do, but what's even more, looking at it from a marketing perspective, all the themes that you were interested in when you were younger are evergreen themes, and they're so present today in everything that we're looking at. I mean, I mean, it's hard to look at the last two and a half years and not think in some way, shape, or form we are in you know, the back end of, a, of or, the, or the start of an apocalyptic sort of scenario. Uh, nature, environment, climate is, is 
ever more present. Here in California, over the last uh, four years, I would say, I think it's about four years, it's where the, the, the fires have been going on. We get the, 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 the forest fires that we've had have been so all-encompassing. It is frightening. Mm -hmm. I've lived here for 20 some odd years. I've never seen it this bad. Um, and we start to see this sort of stuff. I think Australia had the fires. I mean, it, there's, it, the world is changing. But you've been writing about this for a long, long time. So how much of this feels like fiction and how much of it feels almost like um, sadly nonfiction? Well, first of all, this has been um, the most important topic for me um, ever since I was a child. We talked a lot about climate issues and, and, and um, you know, nature around yeah. dinner table. Um, and I was really, I, I always knew nature was really important to me. Uh, so this was, um, in Norway we say right where it burns. And this is where it burns. Right where it burns. Yeah, so that's where the story is sort of developed as well because to be. It has to be you when you write a, a novel. And in writing a novel this huge, you have to marry it, sort of. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and what was your question? Again? Well, no, it's, it's, it's amazing, though, I mean, that what you're writing about, what's burned for you, mm. has, has not changed. But it's almost like the world is caught up. Yes, and when I started to write The History of Bees, the first of these F4 novels in 2013, uh, the world was looking quite different. But we started to see uh, consequences already yeah. uh, back then. Um, but of course, everything has changed. And now it's sort of, um, we t all talk about it. And when I started to write that novel, I didn't think anyone would be interested. Uh, but they were. <laughs> well, they were, but yeah. yeah. And Whether also, you asked if I, if I sort of, I, I use a lot of research, so my, I try to base my future scenarios on research, yeah. on what will or might happen if we don't stop uh, the climate crisis and the nature crisis, because I write a lot about, you know, other species, the value of wild nature. So let's talk about your research, specifically bees, obviously. I want to go back to the, I want to talk about this book in particular, The Last of the Wild Horses. Um, the, um, so there was a lot about horses, these particular horses that I did not expect to see, that I didn't under, that I didn't even know. Um, there was one, I have it here. Yeah, the Takis, like, do they really have 66 chromosomes while the other have 64? I mean, that's fascinating to me. There are another species. The Takis are actually, or... Uh, the experts aren't completely, you know, they disagree a bit, but they are believed to be um, the original wild horse, the one we see on cave paintings. Wow. So when it was rediscovered in Mongolia in the 1880s, it was almost like finding unicorns. Uh, you find sort of the, the, the through horse. Uh, the idea of the horse, uh, if you use Platon. <laughs> I love that. I well, there's yeah. a, there's so, so that's why it was so uh, exceptional as well. And, um, uh, and it's for real. And they are, you, if you uh, breed them with other horses, um, they will, after two generations, be extinct. So uh, they're not dominant. Their genes are not dominant. So you need to almost have a pure form and keep them that way. Yes. Yeah, so, and... Crossbreeding is really, you know, uh, a lot of people are working on crossbreeding to make sure that uh, they um, stay healthy. Uh, because the horses we have in the world right now, uh, the Takis, yeah. they all come from only 13 individuals. That is fascinating. Yes, I know. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, so... You, you find these sort of things, these sort of topics that um, are unique. They have this very wonderful sort of world-building ability around them. I want to ask you, I mean, let's talk about horses again. There's a point when Matthias, um, he's the son of, of Eve, Eva. Karen. I'm sorry, Karen. Yeah. That's correct. Karen. And he, he's a troubled kid. He has a troubled upbringing, a, a drug background. Um, and he, he sort of on this journey with his mom, his mom is sort of reintroducing these horses to, um, to Mongolia. That's the whole idea. And there's varied effects. Some go well, some do not. Um, 
But he asked his mother at one point, um, why horses? You know, I'm really curious for you, where did this start for you? I saw these horses in uh, France, in the mountains of France in 2015, even before the history of bees uh, was done mm -hmm. uh, and was published. And I was really fascinated with the story, with how they were discovered, how they were taken to, to zoos in, in uh, yeah. Europe, how they were almost extinct during um, and after the Second World War, yeah. and how they were uh, they managed to raise the race again from only 13 individuals, and then they uh, were reintroduced to Mongolia. And I found that that story, and I didn't realize until I started writing, that I think I was drawn to that story because um, it shows us our abilities, yeah. uh, what we're capable of, if we only want. That we act took care of these horses only because, I mean, we can't use them. They're yeah. not, uh, they can't be tamed. They're completely wild. They can't be the, uh, domesticated. Can you really reintroduce horses into the wild at this point? Yes. It's, it, it really can be done. Yes. And they, I mean, a couple of thousand of them are now living free in Mongolia. They are. So, yeah, so this book is actually based upon through events. Uh, all of, yeah, I was uh, apart about from that. the future story, of course. Yeah. But the future story could be, well, that's the scary part. It could, it's right around the corner. Um, but when you talk about reintroducing these horses, um, it was fascinating to watch the mating process. It was fascinating to watch where they go and how they, how they migrate and, and how they don't do well. I mean, the, the whole process is fascinating to watch. How much of that was research? How much of it was sort of imagination? Well, it's mostly research, actually. It is. It's a really research-heavy novel. Uh, and I usually do a lot of research, and I usually write about things that I don't know anything about before I start writing. Yeah. So it's like writing a master's thesis every time. <laughs> Has uh, anybody ever called you out and been like, you did not get that right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, a couple of times, but I'm quite you know, um, uh, uh, into the details, and yeah. I try to check everything I, I send this, uh, the manuscript to experts, you do. and I try to make sure everything is... So I have a long list of biologists and different kind of experts that I work with, uh, and that help me. Uh, so yeah, I, I really want, I want everything to be correct. That is Since wonderful. I write about somehow even though uh, it's it, it, the diastopic sort of future stuff even still is very very real and that's what the best science fiction in my mind is all about it's about what's happening now and sort of taking it to the logical or illogical extremes um, which you do um, let's talk about that a little bit we call this a climate quartet there's three books so far so the quartet obviously four Talk to us. First, can you describe to everybody what the Climate Quartet is? Well, I actually don't call it the Climate Quartet myself because this I call it... Is good marketing? Is that what it is? I, I, I call it a quartet because it's actually more about biodiversity yeah. and about all these species we share this wonderful planet with. Uh, but it's definitely also about climate, especially uh, the second book, Blue or The End of the Ocean, which yeah. is the American title. Um, they are about relationship between man and nature, all books. Uh, they're also about um, relationship between parents and children. Yeah. Uh, and I think they can be read as relationship stories. They can be read as political. They can be read as dystopian stories. They can be read as feminist stories. Probably. I think so. Uh, it's up to the reader, really. But I do have a couple of questions that I have. The more I've been writing, the more these questions sort of has been clear to me that mm -hmm. these are the questions I ask. And the first is, how come we, homo sapiens, um, are the ones that change the world? What do we have in us? Mm -hmm. You know, why us? Um, for, for better or for worse? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what's the abilities that made us change the world in such a drastic way. Yeah. And the second question is, do we have it in us to make up for our mistakes? Is it possible for us? Or are we just, you know, too short-sighted? 
uh, oh. very smart but not very very wise. So yeah, these two questions sort of I think run through my my novels. I don't have the answers. Well, I was going to say there's a there's a question I have it written down here where one character says. Um, let me see if I can find this because the line was really striking. Um, let me see if I can bear with me a second here. Uh, da, 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 da. Here we go. Yeah. So it's in Karen's story, uh, and somebody uh, someone says, "Man is the most foolish animal," and that was that was one that I, I, I underlined and came back to over and over again. Um, there's so much that you've just said that I want to come back to, but I am curious. Do you believe that we are the most foolish? Uh, we're smart and foolish at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're definitely extremely good at adapting. That's a strength, uh, but it's also part of the problem. Yeah. Um, we're extremely good at communicating, mm -hmm. which is also a strength, but part of the problem. <laughs> so if we can use these strengths in a good way, um, I think you would find some of the answer. And the answer is also, for me, um, when I look at our ability to feel empathy and to love. Yeah. Uh, because I think we need to learn to love nature more, to appreciate it more, to be able to give names to all the other species on this planet and to, to appreciate, to value them and to realize that they deserve to be here as well. And if we can find it in us to have that love and empathy, I think it would probably also be easier to do all um, the things we need to do, you know, to it, it won't feel as such a big sacrifice, maybe. Fair enough. I think that's, that's, re that's, that's sort of what I got when I read these three books, was that there, there, there are storylines that have less than hopeful endings in my mind, but I do believe that there's a sense of hope that comes from the the belief that if we sort of lean into our connection with nature, that we're going to be better off. Absolutely. And it helps, you know. It, it yeah. does. For me personally as well. Yes. Can we talk? So we're going to get, so the quartet, even though you don't call it the quartet, there is a fourth oh, one a, coming. I call it a quartet, not climate quartet. Well, got it. Okay, good. It <laughs> okay, good. So it's not just climate, it's, it's everything. But, but there I, are. So fine the quartet part yeah. you're fine with, because there is a fourth one coming. Yes. And I don't know if you want to tell us about it. You were telling me about it, but it, it sounds, it's awesome. It is awesome. So, I don't know, would you like to talk a little bit about well, it? Well, it's uh, set in 2110 in Spitsbergen. And it's about plants and seed and trees and everything that grows. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's about the uh, international seed vault, which is set in Svalbard. So that sort of that vault is sort of a treasure in the story. That is it. Uh, and it's uh, it's about a small and closed society in Spitsbergen, which is almost at the North Pole. Uh, and they're hit by um, an illness, an epidemic illness, and only a few people are left. Yeah. And uh, one of them is actually a character okay. that you have met in two other books. So she's sort of a main character for the whole series. And then actually one of the characters from the History of Bees come to, comes to, to Spitsbergen. So I sort of connect you know, the dots. And this, these four books is like, they're, it's like, they're like a big jigsaw puzzle and here the pieces are put together. So it's not even that you're just writing, it's, it's, I actually think quartet is actually not the right word then either. Because when you're reading, like this book right here, it's basically three separate novels, right? Yeah, yeah, you might so, say that. In one yeah. se right, I mean, the, thematically they're the same, but you've basically been writing pieces of the same novel since 2013. I have, but you can definitely read them as standalones. Yes. Without a doubt, yes. without a doubt. That's what makes it, it's an experiment, a literary experiment. One of the reasons I was so excited to talk with you today is because there's very few writers that I've, I mean, I don't think I've ever met a writer who does this, who has this sort of broad vision that becomes this whole, I mean, we're talking about world building. It's unlike anything I've ever really seen. It's, it's really cool. Thank it's beautiful, you. it's very well done. Um, did you ever read, um, uh, Anthony Doar's, uh, uh, not all the light we can't see, but Cloud Cuckoo Land? No, sorry, I didn't. I didn't see. No. So it, it's, it's a new novel, it came out about, about a little less than a year ago. 
Um, he basically takes three stories. Um, one, it, it takes place, I believe, in like uh, the 11th century. One takes place in modern times, maybe the 1980s, I should say. And one takes place distant, distant future. And he breaks them up. And I mean, there's, there must be 54 scene changes. And so he goes between each story multiple times. And I was watching his outline for this thing was massive because it just, it jumps around and, and thematically and all these sorts of things happen to have a cohesive story at the end that works. You're basically doing this with four novels that also have multiple stories within each novel. I, you make it seem so easy, but I mean, your your head must be like a giant, like a like a like bees run, roaming around in your head. Like, how do you see it all? I don't know. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> By the way, I should say when I, you read these books, it doesn't come off as confusing at all. It's absolutely <laughs> remarkable. Well, I uh, I think I'm I'm really good at keeping all these, you know, I, and I don't really take a lot of notes either. I have it quite. Me too. Uh, so there must be um, quite organized brain, maybe. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, sometimes I can be a bit, you know, I can forget other things, though, when yeah. I'm into these knots. I mean, uh, the real life outside of these? Yes. Yeah, I, I think we all have that. Posts. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's really fun. I have uh, I was talking to my mom today for Mother's Day, and she she reminded me it was Mother's Day. So I can tell you I've been there. <laughs> yeah, the rest of the world falls away when you're writing. Yes, yes. It just does. Um, and you're working on quite a bit, you know, screenplays, novels, and all this. It was wonderful. Um, I want to be uh, conscious of time. How are we doing time-wise? We doing okay? Good. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about, you said that you can read these books as environmental sort of books, but you can also come into them as um, relationship uh, stories about relationship and family. Thematically, there, is a, there are wonderful variations on theme between mothers and daughters, mothers and sons, and sons and older mothers. Um, you know, disappointments, uncertainties, children trying to understand their parents, parents trying desperately to understand their children, um, children who want to leave, um, almost like a wild horse would want to leave, um, uh, mothers who don't understand uh, their, their, their child's sexuality. That's a, you know, a theme as well. There's a lot of this. And I'm, I'm curious, each one of these is distinctive and distinct and, and, and unique. And yet you're able to sort of render these so beautifully. I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit about how you, so you sort of pull these, these relationships together, how you see the mother and child relationship. Well, I find that relationship to be really interesting. And I mean, we all have parents or have had parents and um, we know how difficult that can be. Uh, and we know how difficult it can be to have children as well. It's, you invest so much in that relationship. Yeah. And when you, in, and, and there, therefore the stakes, uh, how do you say, stakes are high? Stakes are high, yes. high stakes. Um, and you, when you invest really a lot, you also have so much to lose. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, usually you, you're more fragile, I think, in that relationship than you are in other relationship. And also I think it's really interesting because as a parent, I have three, three boys myself, um, you always have to adapt because mm -hmm. uh, the children, they change all the time. Uh, while you as an adult are pretty much the same. And I mean, I am all, I'm, um, I'm with a, a, a partner, you can also have sort of a stable relationship. You have the same fights, you have the same things that you love about your partner, and it goes on for years and years and years. But with your children, things just change all the time. And it's really hard for an adult to adapt. Uh, so yeah, and I find that, and also I think we, we put our own sorrows and our own hopes into our children, and then we quite often forget that they are, you know, their own persons, that they have other hopes and sorrows, that they're completely different from us. And thematically, it's hard, I would imagine, I know we're getting to the weeds a little bit here, but, you know, in order for a story to work on, on, a, on a story level, the, the main character has to change. That's, you know, you start one place, you, you change thoughts, feelings, behaviors, revelations, you know, throughout. 
I think it's a really tough thing to do, and you pull it off. Uh, you talk about adults who are, they don't like to change. They are set in their ways. And what, you know, I didn't actually see this so much. I, mean, I saw the horses, for instance, as, as sort of thematically the same. But I came into this from a relationship point of view. I was really, really um, amazed at watching these sort of, uh, how can I say this? These, these adult characters who are sort of set in their own ways come to understand through the eyes of their children what really needs to happen. Mm. Um, it's not really a question so much as just a, a comment. I thought it was just so well done. The horses always, when they came in, I was like, oh yeah, it's, there's horses in this. But it's really about the relationships. It's also about uh, us as animals. Um, mm. uh, in Germany, the book is actually called uh, The Last um, of Its Species. Talk about the of humans? its kind, the last of its kind. So it's sort of a, a title that can be used both on horses and us which I find beautiful, because the yeah. book is definitely also about us as animals and our relationship to all the other species on this planet. How do we take care of them? How do we yeah. respect them? There's some moments of horror, true mm. horror in mm. these novels. And it's, it's the, I mean, are we endangered animals too? I mean, obviously the answer is yes. I mean, you read these, and you, there's hope. I mean, we should talk about this a little bit too. Some of the reviews I've read and some of the people who you know, talk about your books are also sort of curious about these endings. Do you find that these are hopeful moments? Do you end on hopeful moments? Do you find that there's hope? Uh, I'm into open endings. <laughs> yeah, I noticed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I don't want to spoil the ending stuff, no, but I'm really... I think it's up to the reader. Okay. Yeah, and that's the beauty of literature, obviously, that there are as many versions of a book as there are readers. Isn't that uh, wonderful? Yes. Yeah. And it's quite interesting to see how um, in different countries, some countries read my books as more positive than others. Yeah. I remember some reviews from Denmark, for example, where they found the endings to be really uh, hopeful. Yeah. Oh, and others yeah. find them to be bleak. Yeah. So it's... Uh, it, it, true, it, it all depends on the reader, but I, I mean, I'm not, obviously not a politician. I don't have the answers. And I like, yeah. I, 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 I have all these questions and I guess with sort of an open ending where you can find both darkness and light, you also sort of end with a question. I think it's, um, what's wonderful about Again, we go back to Last of the Wild Horses. What's wonderful is you don't know where these horses are going to wind up or how they're going to wind up. But if you read, you know, the story that takes place in the distant future, you have an idea of where these things wind up. And even what's fascinating is that some of these stories that take place in the modern, the modern storylines actually end with a, a, a jump forward. So, I mean, you play with time quite a bit. Um, is that sort of how you view a lot of your stories and how you, you know, that that deep scope. Uh, I didn't quite understand the well, question. Actually. Well, I guess, the, but this brings us to the idea of like ap apocalyptic sort of stories. Mm -hmm. Many of your stories, um, history of bees, uh, story with the last uh, the last wild horses. We are moving deep into the future, mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of apocalyptic endings, or, or we know that it's sort of a bleak future. And but you also sort of set some of these stories in the deep, deep past. And I'm wondering if, if I don't know, when, you, when you're creating these stories, I mean, is, do you start from a place of the past and move to the, do you naturally move into the future? Where, how do, because I see a theme here. Yes, no, I, it's always the stories that decide, you know, what, what I need. So uh, with the history of bees, for example, I knew I wanted to tell a story about the, the beginning of modern beekeeping. Mm -hmm. And I knew I wanted to tell the story about the colony collapse disorder and the disappearance of bees that yeah. started in 2007 here in got its name in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to tell a story about how the world can look if all the pollinating insects disappear. It's fascinating. And um, with the end of the ocean, I wanted to tell uh, a story about how Europe uh, and the world can look if we don't stop global warming. 
and it's a story about the value of water. Uh, so I needed to have, you know, both past, present, and future to, to sh sort of show the scope of my theme. And with the horses, the story was there, based on the true story of the horses. So That's it's, true. It's so you always I wanted need to, tell. to do this. Yes, Are it's you always, and it's really not, it doesn't even feel like a deliberate choice. It's more based on the material. The material gives It tells me. you what you need to do. Yes, yes. Okay, so that brings me to my next question. Once you're done with this quartet, are you just going to go back to simple? Are you going to do like, you know, let's talk about a kid's book. Uh, well, I do write for children as well. I uh, uh, all the time, really. I love to write for children. Or I write all ages, I would yeah. say, because I love my children's books also to be, to be good re it's to a, read for adults. It's, so. it's hard to do that, to be able to leap from adult fiction to YA to children. It, it, the skill, it's a very different skill. I know writers who stick with YA because that's really all they, they can do. And I say that with all due respect. There's people who do, I, I do adult fiction because it's the only thing that I, I know how to do because if I do the young, it doesn't come off as genuine. You have this ability to be able to do everything. Well, for me, it's always about the character and it doesn't really feel, it feels the same. Even if, if I write for children or all ages or if I write for adults. Yeah. It's always about, you know, taking your character seriously yeah. and looking at the world through the eyes of him or her. And um, when I do that, uh, the language comes along. Uh, so then it doesn't really... I never, I never think about the reader, actually. I think about my character to make uh, the character true and to make the story come alive. And so I really don't really... You know, uh, it's not like I write for a target group. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I love that. It's, it's the same technique throughout. And if, it, if your character happens to be in a world that's younger, okay, then it's for younger audiences and that's, that people relate to it. But if it's, I, I think it's an absolutely beautiful way to put that. I'm actually going to use that when I start to teach again. It's, <laughs> it is. It's, it's about being true to the character. Every, every story has a certain, the same elements in terms of you know, desire, need, psychological need, moral need, um, antagonist. Uh, all of the sort of fo all, all the elements are in every single quote unquote genre that you do or age group that you do. It's, it's beautiful. Um, okay, so. I want to ask you one last thing, and then I'm going to open it up to questions for the audience. Um, I read a few uh, pieces about sort of your experience during the lockdown. Every writer has had very different experiences. Isolation can be helpful. It can be harmful. Um, I read that you journaled. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what the last two and a half years have been like for you. Uh, quiet, yeah. uh, which in the beginning was, I mean, in March 2020, I think we were all kind of scared. Uh, it was a shock. Um, for me, uh, I think it was sort of a feeling of a new vulnerability, yeah. um, which we all still feel, I think. Uh, the world has changed uh, now with war. Uh, we see the consequences of climate changes uh, more and more every year, so there is this new vulnerability that started in March 2020, as I see the world. Um, and the beginning, yeah, I was really shocked. But then after a while, it was also good, you know, to calm down. I had a very stressful life uh, since 2015 when the History of Bees uh, was published. I traveled way too much. Yeah. Um, and it was good just to be home. <laughs> and then after a while, uh, I was bored. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same for everyone, really. It is. It's it sort is. of the same process we all went Except you through. were turning yours into a novel, which is, yes, well, you know. Yes, I wrote the book about uh, the first days of uh, the pandemic, and mm -hmm. then also I, all, I wrote uh, the last novel of the quartet. So, but now finally it's good to be able to meet all the ends again, to meet readers. Be able to come out to California. Yes, yes, even though it's a paradox to fly this far to talk about climate issues. Yeah, right. it is, yes. you know. I, I worked in, um, we talked a little bit, I worked in TV uh, years ago and we used to go to, um, to LA. I worked in Boston and New York and we'd have to fly to LA. Uh, for these these press junkets, uh, the, uh, the uh, Television Critics Association press tours, what we called it, and um, 
we were premier premiering, I worked at PBS, we did a, a documentary on uh, climate uh, crisis uh, called uh, Prescription for Survival. And another one called Last Days on Planet Earth. Edward Norton was part of it, uh, Brad Pitt, they were all sort of these big names that were narrating this docu these documentaries. And they each showed up driving gas guzzling cars. And I'm flying across the country and like somebody brought up, isn't it sort of like, you know, Yes. You're not preaching what you, you're not doing what you preach. It's really hard and it's always a choice, you know, and I usually say no uh, to, I say no yeah. to more and more and I also try to, you know, take train if possible. But yes, yeah. uh, uh, it's, it's, and that's sort of, um, I think it's hard for everyone in a, on a small or larger scale to take the right choices and that's why we need good politics, you know, we need yeah. brave politicians that actually limit us and help us limit ourselves. I don't trust, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's harder, harder and harder. We almost have to do it on an individual level in some ways too, right? Like the way what you're talking both. about. We, we need, need both, we definitely yeah. need both. But uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. It's wonderful. Yeah. So thank you, Maya. Um, I'm gonna open it up now to, to questions from the audience. If anybody has any thoughts about any books or, or anything about writing, anything. Yeah. Because I haven't, oh, okay, sorry. I have not read your book, but I intend to. Um, the question of domestication. So you were saying these horses can't be domesticated. I know that there's some question now whether they really are wild or they were descendants of the originally dom domesticated horses. My question is about domestication. It's the animal changing itself to be able to interact with humans, not humans changing themselves so much to be able to interact with the animals. And that relationship, I thought, was, I mean, I, I think it's an interesting kind of relationship about this domestication um, question. And as humans, have we domesticated animals into their own extinction? Because they have to change to become like us or inter to be able to interact with us. But that also means they can't survive in the way that they developed in the environment. And so have we just by domesticating animals, and the ones that survive are domesticable, but have we also you know, doomed them in that way? Uh, it's an interesting question. And yes, I, I mean, we have definitely doomed a lot of species I mean, species die every day on this planet, are extinct every day. Um, and the domesticated animals are, um, you know, they, <laughs> there's a lot of them. <laughs> uh, it's the wild animals that are in, in danger. Uh, and, uh, and they are only, I mean, aren't, I think it's like 4% on the animal of the animals on this planet are wild and rest are 4% 4 or 5%. Wow. Yeah, and the rest are us and our domesticated animals. Um and I don't know if you read uh, Sapiens, Harari. Yes, uh, yes, he yes. talked a lot about this, how the uh, development of agriculture and uh, the domestication of animals really a huge part of the reason why we are uh, in this situation that we are. Wow. So we did. We basically doomed ourselves. Yeah. Well, we the, animals. The, the animals, exactly. Thank you. It was a wonderful question. I saw there was a question over here. I'm looking forward to reading your book about seeds and the seed bank. Uh, and I wonder if you have any thoughts about uh, the ideas that domestication of plants into such narrow, sort of focused industrial species uh, is one of the threats that we're all facing. Uh, it's actually a sub theme in my latest novel because. Um, monocultures with very, you know, um, seed that are 
aren't quite flexible, but are really just specialized for that kind of monoculture, um, uh, uh, agricultural. <laughs> uh, they are uh, not flexible when it comes to changing weather, uh, to changing climate. Um, mm -hmm. So we need, we need biodiversity. We need a lot of different uh, plants. And um, we need our farms to have biodiversity and we need to go away, away from the monoculture. So that's, yeah, it's really an important uh, task for the world and it's really part of the solution is, um, I think it's to, to look at how we grow our food and to, uh, to make more, um, uh, to make nature wild again and also to make farming um, more flexible and have farms that are completely different organized than the one we see today. That's wonderful. When is the, when's the fourth book? Do you have an idea when it might be out? In Norway this autumn. Oh, it's uh, great. Yeah, and I don't know, usually uh, the US are quite late, uh, so maybe two years from now. <laughs> it might be easier for me to learn the language rather than have to wait for the translation. So it's worth it. Yeah. Hi, I'm sorry I missed the beginning of your lecture. I, uh, I work with horses all my life. Um, I don't know if you addressed the question of wild horses and trying to control the um, breeding or the proliferation um, in an artificial way or if we let everybody just live their lives, what happens to them. And also, I've, I've seen the horses in Mongolia. I don't know if you address th that situation. Well, I talked a little bit about it, yes. And uh, they do follow the breeding uh, quite, um, they do follow it and they try to make sure that the breeding is, you know, that there is good crossbreeding, so to speak, so the animals are, don't have any trouble. And they ha it has, of course, been a major part of um, getting, um, when they started with only 13 individuals, uh, the breeding was really important. So it was done really neat, you know, with schemes and our schedules and, yeah. I don't know how they do that now, because now there are a couple of thousands of these horses in the world. But in the beginning, everything was really controlled. Which you actually see a little bit of in this, in this book. So um, I don't know if you've had a chance to read this one. This is The Last of the Wild Horses. It's the latest one. It's, if you, if this that goes into a lot of that goes into Mongolia. Um, I think all three, all three storylines or two storylines go into the Mongolian. Two of them, that's right, two of them do. But they really go there, um, and it's 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 really great. The level of research you did on that as well, because these are in different eras and different. I mean, the original was eighteen, uh, the late eighteen hundreds, correct? Um, we we talk a we haven't talked a lot about this research, but how in the world did you do that? Oh, it was research heavy. Uh, it, it must yes. have been. It, and I went to Mongolia. I went to Russia. You did. Yes, you did. I slept in a tent on the steps in Mongolia. <laughs> Wow. Yes, and I, uh, no, it was just overwhelming. And uh, I had uh, weeks uh, with this book that I was like, oh, why did I do this? <laughs> <laughs> you set yourself up. Yeah. Yeah. But it's true because it's world building that you, it, you feel it, you smell it, you taste it. It's, the, all the senses are, are covered in, an, in, in this era that no, we, we, you couldn't have gone to. And yet you really capture it. The, the, his, you know, the relationship with Mikhail, Mikhail and, and Wolf uh, was fascinating because it wasn't just about the relationship. It was about the world around them that was happening at that time. I mean, it, it feels very present. Thank you. I read a lot of Tolstoy, actually. Yeah, oh, okay. Yes. Tolstoy, yes. never go wrong. No. Um, do we have any other questions? You will read the book. That's not a question, but a great comment. Um, so we are going to be um, signing books, uh, uh, tent, uh, one of the first tents, um, 
Let me get that right. Uh, tent nine, I believe it is. Um, so right on the corner, when you go over to the plaza, just walk Alston all the way up, and it's the very first tent. We will be there signing books. Um, I'll be signing a little bit of mine, but mainly uh, mine is going to be uh, there to answer any questions and sign books and personalize them as well. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, guys, thank you for coming. Um, and thank you, Maya, for coming all the thank way you. out. It, this is honestly, I, I told you this as we were walking over. Being able to sit here and talk with you and pick your brain about the complex things that you were able to, to pull off, you make it look easy. I know it wasn't easy at all. And this has been a project that's well over almost a decade long in the process. It's been incredible to sort of follow the process. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you do next. Thank you. Thank you for the conversation. <laughs>